So thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you to the organizers of the event for inviting me. So as you heard, I'm a physician here, and I'll speak to you today about uh, digital health innovation uh, as I see it. And as you heard, my background originally was engineering. So degree in electronic engineering, master's computer engineering, PhD biomedical engineering, then medicine, and then an MBA. So when I got a permanent job in 2018, my father cried with happiness that I was finished college. Um, and people ask that sometimes, why would you do that? Or what, 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 how does that change your perspective of problems? Because obviously engineers are problem solvers. And in medicine, there's lots of clinical problems. And the best way I can describe it is if you go down to the emergency department because somebody has a cut in their leg, as a doctor, you go down and say, oh, you have a cut in your leg, we're gonna to have to you know, put a bandage on that and give you oral antibiotics to, to prevent infection or to treat the infection. As a biomedical engineer, you go down and you say, oh, well, I wonder could we actually put the antibiotics into the bandage and, and that would be a better solution. But as an MBA, you go down and you say, well, what are you even doing in the emergency department? You should be in an urgent care facility far away. You know, it's, it's about the systems thinking. And I think that's really important when you come to think about solutions, about their context and about the practicality of their implementation. Because a lot of people develop really nice technology in labs, but then it has no relevance at the bedside. There are solutions looking for problems, and it's better always to start at the bedside, then go to the bench, and then come back to the bedside. So you're obviously in Galway, Ireland, so welcome to everyone uh, who's visiting. Uh, famous for its beautiful coastal um, location, and also that Christopher Columbus visited here uh, before he departed for America. There's a statue to it down in the clad area of the city you might see later on in your walk. And the university, founded in 1845, it's a, uh, a Harry Potter looking university is what all my colleagues tell me in the United States. Um, but it's famous for two real things. One professor, George Stoney, he famously coined the term electron, uh, which stamped our mark in STEM worldwide. And then Professor William King, uh, around the same time, uh, coined the term Neanderthal. So there were two early wins for us on, on the world stage. And more recently, we've had a lot of wins in the med tech area. So we had 14 out of the 15 top medtech companies in the world in Ireland up to this year. And then last week we got the 15th uh, when Dexcom announced 1,000 jobs in, in Galway. So we have a, a longitude of excellence here in the west of Ireland for medtech, similar to California, Minnesota, Boston, us, Berlin, and Singapore. And the reason for that is, is historical. We realize we don't have a lot of natural resources uh, except the people. So in the 1990s, the government decided to bring in a policy whereby we could get a free third level education. And being English speaking and being in Europe, or even more in Europe now, thanks to uh, Brexit, uh, we're, we're the site of a, a lot of interest for multinational corporations. We make half the world's ventilators, a third of the world's contact lenses, um, half the world's insulin administration devices. Uh, we're an expert in med tech design, research, and also um, manufacturing. And we just launched here in Galway, the first in Europe dual physician year program uh, and that means that some students actually do their medical degree and then do their engineering degree uh, during the same uh, program. Uh, and that's kind of what it is like in the States where you do an undergraduate before you do medicine. So some programs in the States are, uh, you do engineering, for example, in Northwestern, and then you go on and you do medicine in Northwestern, same in Boston. So we're the first in Europe to do that, and uh, I think that really speaks to the commitment that the education sector has in supporting future innovation. We're not just thinking about next year, we're thinking about next decade. So I'm a doctor in the hospital, as you heard, half my time I, I, I walk around the hospital and meet patients and try and help them with my clinical team. And then when I started in 2018, I realized just like a honeybee on its own can't make honey, um, we needed to start a hive, the health innovation via engineering. And I'm fortunate because we have a dual located campus to work with some really amazing people in all different disciplines, in medicine, engineering, computer science, education, and psychology. One of my colleagues, uh, Professor Walsh, will speak in a few minutes. Uh, as a testament to the, the need to have this multi-stakeholder involvement in healthcare innovation. So this is the team we've worked with in the last five years. We've been lucky to do some really innovative projects, some of which you're going to see. I am not Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? 
I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? So, so even though it sounds far-fetched, um, very quickly we're going to have personalized avatars for your healthcare journey from wellness into disease and back into wellness again, hopefully. So it is quite likely in the next few years when somebody says to you, who's your doctor, you could say it's Morgan Freeman. <laughs> uh, because that would be your personal healthcare avatar, which we're going to talk about. We've started researching that recently. Um, and it's about that joining of technology to improve the healthcare outcome. So if you know who these people are, that means you're over 40. Um, <laughs> this is the crew of the Starship Enterprise, the original crew. Um, and what they're holding there is a tricorder, which in the 1960s was a mythical device that you could have multiple physiological signals in a handheld device. Before we talk about that, I wanted to talk to you about what innovation is. And I think Steve Jobs um, sums it up best about what innovation means and about the way you need to look at the world. So the thing I would say is when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. So wise words about looking at things with a new lens. So digital health, how do we get here? Why are we talking about it now? Um, as a physician, when you think about the most powerful tool in medicine, hygiene is always pretty high up there because since we realized it's better to wash your hands, people live longer after surgery, um, you know, countless millions of people have been saved. Antibiotics obviously have been re revolutionary in medicine, that's pretty powerful. Vaccines we've seen recently with COVID, but I would argue that data is the most important thing in medicine and we've always known it, you know, for a long time uh, because the first thing you're taught in medical school as a clinical medical student is how to take a good patient history and all their vitals. And then you use that data to make a pretest probability of a disease and then you use the diagnostic test to actually confirm or deny that. So data is really important in medicine. And in the world, data has become very valuable as you heard from the last speaker. So 15 years ago, what we considered valuable on planet Earth was oil and hedge, um, hedge, uh, hedge companies. Um, they were the most valuable companies in the world, hedge fund companies. Um, but what's happened in a very short period of time, don't forget the iPhone only came out in 07, is that the most valuable thing on planet Earth, and we know this by market capitalization, which is the way we, you know, we give value to companies, the most valuable companies on Earth are the data companies. Um, in a very short period of time, they figured out how to monetize data, primarily through things like cookies, um, things that you have to accept uh, before you can proceed. And that's because if you just randomly went to a bookstore website, the book they show you, you probably have a 5% chance of buying that book. But if they, if they know you've been to a website about traveling to Ireland, conferences about digital health, and so on, by the time you go to that bookstore website, you're going to get a, a recommendation for short tours of Ireland, uh, and therefore you're more likely to buy that book. And once they figured that out in around the year 2000, they made an awful lot of money, and they're continuing to make money. <coughs> and, and they've done that across the world of, of mainly around um, um, shopping. That's the, 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 main, the main thing that they've done so far. But they're coming now for health data. That's the next thing they're coming for. Okay, and if you go back to health, then if you think of, again, engineering-wise, traditionally, people come to a centralized structure for healthcare, uh, whereas we see with the um, data, it's, it's a largely decentralized process. So people come to these great cathedrals of hospitals f to meet the experts, to get the equipment, to get their diagnosis and treatment. It's a bricks and mortar model. 
Um, but everything else that we've seen in the last 15, 20 years has gone online and become decentralized. Department stores where you used to have to go into different sections to buy things, that's all gone online. And banking as well. And I think big picture, if you think of healthcare, um, most of your transactions in your bank, hopefully by now, are done on your phone or on your laptop. You rarely go into a bank to do something unless maybe you're signing a mortgage and even that can be done electronically. And healthcare is going to go the same way. So in the next five, 10 years, 90% of what you do with healthcare will be digital to digital. Okay, and then you will have to go in once a year for a physical visit for a piece of equipment that you can't have in your house. Um, and a lot of the things that have been figured out by uh, retail and by banking, all the stuff about encryption and security with data, um, healthcare has been watching that develop. Healthcare would never be the first into that. The first thing you're taught in medical school is premium non non cherry, which is firstly do no harm. So medicine by its nature is conservative. It doesn't want to do something to a patient in case of unforeseen consequences. So it's a very conservative um, uh, industry. Think of it like an oil tanker. It changes direction, but it changes it very slowly. Whereas the data companies, they flit around because they don't have the same duty of care to patients. So healthcare is starting to adopt this now. And part of the reason for that is Moore's law. Uh, the fact that the, the computers in your pocket are more powerful than they were um, you know, even last year, not to mind five years ago. And we've seen that most clearly with you know, cell phones getting smaller over the years. In fact, cell phones can be the size of a necklace pendant. Only for the, around the year of 2007, when Steve Jobs launched the iPhone, they realized pretty quickly when you had a device in your pocket that could connect to the internet and play videos, humans wanted to watch cat videos on trains. So they needed, <laughs> they needed big screens. And in that 15 years, all those discrete devices that you see here are now on your phone. And that's a remarkable transformation. The next thing that's going to happen is we're moving from 4G to 5G. So not only do you have a supercomputer in your pocket, it's now going to be possible to connect to all the other supercomputers in your pocket and around your house, the IoT, the Internet of Things. And, you know, 5G is faster, it can take more data, but the big thing it can do is it can have more connections per cell. The best way to think about that is if you're at a large concert, you're going to see Taylor Swift in Tampa, Florida, and you're there with 80,000 people, and you take a picture and you want to send it to somebody to tell them you're living your best life, <laughs> uh, and you can't get a cell phone signal because, you know, in the cell zones that surround that concert, maybe only a thousand people can actually get a cell signal because the, the cell um, pickup in that cell is only 200 people, whereas 5G is a, a thousand times that. So you're going to have far more connectivity. So moving forward then, so you know these people hopefully. This is uh, Donald Trump, former president, former president of the United States, uh, maybe a future one we'll see. Uh, and then the other person, uh, this is difficult because there's been a lot of UK prime ministers. This is uh, <laughs> Ter Theresa May. And she was on uh, television with Donald about two years or three years ago now. Um, and everyone saw this picture and were like, wow, look at her left arm. That's amazing. MI5 tracks British Prime Minister. <laughs> Bond on the case. Yeah. But anyone who works in the medical world knows that's a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor. And that was really the beginning of that kind of you know, wearable technology going onto the world stage, literally. Uh, so my own background is clinical problems, engineering solutions. Uh, NASA have a website where they they have a lot of clinical problems because it's difficult to put humans in space. It's a very harsh environment. And a few years ago, I saw they had a problem with astronauts sleeping in space. So you have 16 sunrises and sunsets in a day when you're in orbit. That's really bad jet lag. And the only way you can monitor sleep quantitatively on Earth is PSG, polysomnography, which is lots of electrodes in the, the head and the chest and so on. Works okay on Earth. It's terrible in space because you end up like Pinocchio. So myself and my colleague, we saw that problem when we developed a bio vest about 12 years ago now, um, and that bio vest, this is me wearing the bio vest <laughs> before, I, before I turn 40. Um, but we developed this bio vest that looks at heart rate variability to decide what stage of sleep you're in, REM sleep or non-REM sleep, and it was chosen by NASA to fly on space missions because it is a very ergonomic way of seeing the quality of sleep that you get. And so this idea of remote monitoring was really championed by NASA because they've been doing it for a long time since the Mercury astronauts, you know, monitoring humans at a distance. Um, and then they invited me back a few years later to, to be the flight surgeon for a mission that they were doing underwater. So before they go to the moon and Mars, they practice on habitats on Earth to check out all the protocols and all the technology so they don't go up to you know, a Martian base, take out a, a wrench and say, oh my God, it's the wrong size, it doesn't work. You know, it's too late then. So they do all that practice here and they take high fidelity simulations like here, this was the Aquarius habitat, which is like a large bus sunk under the ocean off the Florida Keys. There's one in the Mojave Desert, there's one in 
the lava fields of Hawaii, there's one in the high Arctic. And, and they test astronauts or aquanauts in these spaces for mission protocols. So I was the flight surgeon for that. So I was responsible for crew health. And you know, this was 2016. And in those kind of portable wearable vest devices, we could get the kind of data uh, and physiological monitoring that you could only really get in ICUs, you know, two or three years previously. We could suddenly do it in the field in a remote environment. Uh, and what was interesting about this mission was that not only were we looking at crew health, we were using their health data to decide who would do mission activities. So I was ringing the crew commander saying, actually, I think astronaut or aquanaut number four got a great sleep the last three nights. That's the person that should go outside the shuttle today or the habitat to do the EVA. So we were using health data to make decisions not related to sickness, if that, if that makes sense. That's moved since 2016 now into the next uh, area which needs monitoring of high, uh, high performance individuals, in this case, sport. So if you would have seen the World Cup and um, recently a lot of people when they score goals, they took off their tops and you saw all the monitoring that they had, all the GPS data and so on. It's standard now for all the big foot soccer clubs, NBA, basketball, baseball. They all monitor their, their players throughout the season so they can predict injuries before they ha happen and rest them and so on. So you can pick your best 11 people. And that's obviously moving then into, um, into healthcare. So the idea being that uh, the insurance companies now like to reduce your premiums if you connect in a little widget under your car to show that you drive during daylight hours, you never break the speed limits, you always indicate before turning, they reduce your premiums by 10%, especially for learner drivers. The same thing's happening and gonna happen in healthcare. So if you're walking 10,000 steps a day with your pedometer, you're gonna get 5% less in your insurance, your health insurance. And this is the beginning of this kind of frontier of us being comfortable sharing our data for a benefit. Um, because the data that we share is going to be valuable. And I, get, I gave a TED talk on this in 2019. When I started my new um, post in 2018, um, I come back from the States, I come back with the experience of the remote monitoring and someone said, you know, can you, can you talk about your, your digital health experience? Uh, and in 2019 BC, before COVID, um, I had this, this unfortunate uh, incurable disease called new consultantitis. <laughs> so when you get appointed as a consultant, you come in with lots of great ideas and then you meet the treacle of a health system. You know, it's very hard to swim in treacle because, you know, it's established and it's conservative and it's difficult to affect change. So I gave that talk and I basically said in 2019, you know what, we should be just doing a lot of this chronic disease management remotely. It just makes sense. Why is a patient driving two hours down from, you know, Clare Island or Clifton to come down, park for half an hour, wait in a waiting room for 20 minutes to see me for 10 minutes? Makes no sense, no matter what the metric, economic, time, environmental. Um, and I put in a grant at the time to the health service and said, can you fund this, you know, remote monitoring of chronic diseases? And they wrote back and said, no, it's not, not something we're interested in at the moment. Uh, and then, of course, we had a big bang disruptor about eight months later <laughs> called COVID-19. Uh, and I got a phone call from the people that I'd sent the grant into saying, oh, Professor O'Keefe, um, you know this virus thing that's going on in Asia, yeah? You know that proposal you put in last summer? You couldn't do that now, could you? And I was like... Yeah, could do it. When do you want it to be done? They were like, this weekend. <laughs> and I was like, no, we can't do that. But we did do virtual care with telephones because we hadn't invested in the infrastructure, unfortunately. So COVID-19 has been just beyond transformational. 10 years of innovation in one year uh, and more of an appetite now to take on new technology into healthcare. This is one of the things that we did in COVID. It's a robot to remind people to wash their hands. This is a droid audiovisual educator, or Dave for short. It's the most advanced civilian robot available, fully programmable with facial recognition, artificial intelligence, and a series of lasers and radars to judge the... No, I'll leave it there because we've got to make sure I get finished by half past or Jane will kill me. So, so that we, put that, we, put, we put that robot at the front of the hospital. I noticed, again, wearing full PPE in May 2020, that for every 10 people coming into the hospital, half of them didn't wash their hands on the way in for lots of reasons. They might have done it in the car, they might have been stressed because they're visiting a relative who has COVID or sick. But I remember thinking, what am I putting all this PPE in, trying to help people, and they're bringing in, you know, viral vectors. Um, I couldn't stand there all day because I'd go back to the wards. So I wrote a grant that weekend, got a, a, a project proposal, got it funded for a robot, and we put the robot at the front of the door of the, door of the hospital. And guess what? We had 100% compliance. <laughs> because when people come in then, the robot said, hello, would you like to wash your hands? And everyone was like, uh, okay, yeah, sure, of course. And they went over and washed their hands. So they just needed a digital nudge. Okay, now we didn't enable all the features because like that robot in particular is called Pepper uh, from SoftBank Robotics. It, it has cameras in its eyes. So you can actually, you know, recognize people and say their name. And that would be the next level of dystopia. You know, hey, would you like to wash your hands? No, I'm Grant. Okay, Dave. 
<laughs> I'll tell HR. But we didn't, we didn't go there for that. But just by nudging people, their behavior improved, which I think Jane will touch on in a while. Another thing that we did in the last three years was, and this was one of the things we're proud of, we got the, um, the project into the London Museum of Science, is we did the world's first delivery of uh, insulin by drone. So back in 2019, the only people delivering stuff by drone over the horizon was the US Air Force, and they weren't dropping medications. Um, because drones uh, in the non-civilian space only fly about a kilometer or two. You can go to a toy store, buy a drone, fly the medication across this room, and say you delivered medication. But that's not practical, okay? That's just like a, you know, a proof of concept or feasibility. What we wanted to show is that we could fly drones beyond the horizon, deliver a medicine, and then come back. So you're looking at 30, 40 kilometers each direction. And again, that was way outside the civilian scope back in 2019. And we did it because of a real problem. There was a big flood that, that, um, that January, and uh, it was the biggest problem we had before we had a global pandemic. And uh, a lot of the patients who come to my clinic, I went up to my clinic and you know, I expect 50 patients there, patients with type one diabetes, you need to take insulin every day. And when I got to the clinic, there was like six people there, which made no sense. And then the people were ringing in saying, you know, doc, I can't get in because all the rain, I've been flooded out in my farm. Uh, I'll make an appointment again in three weeks time. We were like, that's fine, we'll, we'll organize another appointment. And then they said, doc, I actually, I'm running out of my insulin. I was gonna come in today and get a, a repeat prescription. What am I gonna do? And people with type one diabetes need insulin to live. So if they run out of it, they're in big trouble, obviously. So at the time, all I could do was look at the weather forecast and say, well, actually, it looks like you'll be okay by Friday. You should be okay. And thankfully, at the time we were, and people were able to get to the pharmacy. But it made me think, what would happen if it was a more extreme weather event than three days of rain, if it was five days of rain or something. So I look back through what's been done already and Hurricane Katrina is probably the best example where unfortunately due to a, you know, an unusually um, large hurricane, uh, there was massive flooding and people with chronic diseases just died who needed life-saving medicines because you couldn't send helicopters to everybody. It just wasn't feasible. So that's what was the trigger for the project to actually go in and figure out all the aerospace regulation stuff because that was a, a nightmare because they don't like drones flying near airports or in controlled airspace. Same with all the pharmaceutical regulations, because there's a cold chain for pharmaceuticals. You can't just, you know, put it in your pocket, and deliver it to somebody. Then to, to fill out all the, or to sort out all the dispensing um, regulations, because there's a reason you can't get your pharmacy products through your front door, like mail order. It has to be dispensed to a known person. And then to fill it, fill it, figure out all the technical issues. But we did it, which was great, and we got into the British Museum of Science. I came to the island 31 years ago. I'm insulin dependent. We make medicine for people with diabetes. Access to this medicine, it's more than important because without it, I would be dead. It's gonna be a great mission. We had a really productive meeting there with all the project team for the diabetes drone. The Sky Tango, allowing us to coordinate the actual mission between all the stakeholders. Nova Nordisk, whose medicine will be part of the payload today. A wing copter who are giving us the actual drone that's going to fly to the island. Vodafone who are going to be providing the drone data link connectivity. And Survey Drones Ireland who are actually going to execute the flight for us for this innovative Beyond Visual Line of Sight flight. The mission has just taken off. The Diabetes Drone Project was centred around delivering medications to the Iron Islands. It's, it's absolutely unreal. Visual contact. Really amazing to do this, the first in the world delivery by BVLOS of diabetes medicine. Everything is here that we need. Fantastic. Fantastic, yeah. So um, the minute I did that, I had like 100 WhatsApp messages from friends saying, can I get a pizza? Can I, can I get coffee? Um, and again, we did this as a proof of concept to show you could fly a drone beyond the horizon in controlled airspace. It hadn't been done up to then for anything, really. There had been a company in Africa at the time called Zipline delivering blood over the horizon, uh, but through jungles, not through controlled airspace in, in Europe or in, in FAA class one space. Um, and we did it through multi-stakeholder engagement. And since then, an Irish company has actually commercialized it called Mana Drones, if you want to read about them, uh, Mana from Heaven. They're now delivering pizza and coffee and so on all around Dublin and soon in Europe. They're already doing it in Dallas and Texas because uh, they've commercialized it because it is going to be the next frontier of delivery. So in the lab, we do a lot of digital health research around diabetes because that's a clinical specialty area of mine. Um, and then also more general things. And guess what? Once the tail end of COVID was, was falling away, last summer, uh, Professor Walsh and myself and others, we again applied for a chronic disease remote care model for patients to prevent them coming down. And we actually got the funding this time. They actually said, yeah, you know what, that actually might be useful. Um, so we started a project last year on Clare Island, which is an island off the coast of Ireland with no digital infrastructure. So we called the codename Project New York. 
because if we can make it there, we can make it anywhere, <laughs> right? So this is somewhere you can't even get a cell phone signal. So we said, hmm, perfect, let's do it here. So we have to build all the digital infrastructure, the 5G networks. We've got to put in all the tech. We've got to get engagement from the community. And we've lots of different work packages from, you know, basic remote monitoring. So I have patients now on the island where when we have a virtual consultation, I see them with a video, video consult system. But then I also see all their physiological data, all their glucose, their insulin, their step count, their weight, their blood pressure, all in real time. And then the idea then is that I can also uh, triage those patients. So traditionally, when I see a patient at clinic, any doctor in the world, when they see them, they look at you, they say, you're doing great, Frank. Uh, things are going well. I'll see you in six months or I'll see you in 12 months because they're basing their decision today on your presentation and your historical chart. Okay, but again, that's a really static way of doing it. They have no way of knowing three months time you walk out, you get diagnosed with cancer, you're on chemotherapy or you're on dexamethasone. You need to be seen again for your blood sugar or blood pressure control. But they don't know that because it's static. So we've developed an algorithm now to actually dynamically schedule you into clinics depending on your physiological need. So if your sugar starts to go off or your blood pressure or your weight with heart failure, you'll be automatically scheduled back into clinic, if that makes sense. And that way it's good because you're seeing the patients that need to be seen the most. We're also doing uh, interesting things with medical robots, which is a different talk, um, called Madra. And um, I might actually leave it there because it's half past. So uh, the last thing I wanted to say was about AI, about the importance of AI in this whole landscape. Um, and I have one slide, just or two more slides, Jane. Uh, when you hear about AI, 95% of AI is the first box, machine learning, okay? AI is a great term. We think about the movies, we think about, you know, um, the Terminator and so on, but most of AI is machine learning. It's you listening on YouTube to Taylor Swift, and then it recommends Katy Perry. Okay, it's machine learning, it's pattern recognition. You like this type of music, so here's another type of music. Okay, that's all it does. You're driving in your Tesla down the road and it looks at the white lines and it beeps if you go outside them because it's pattern recognition. Okay, so it's single domain pattern recognition. The things that people are most worried about is machine intelligence and then ultimately machine consciousness. Uh, and we're far away from that is the, is the reality. Do we need ethical oversight and regulation oversight? Absolutely. Okay, anything to do with humans, we normally regulate. Food, water safety, pharmaceuticals, healthcare. Why wouldn't we regulate AI? So I think the European initiative in this area is very welcome because the track record is if people try and regulate themselves, they really don't. So that's the first thing. Will it be a powerful tool in medicine? Definitely. Okay, it'll complement medics, not compete against them. So I'll leave it there and I'll hand over to Jane who might want to take over about the psychology aspect of, of healthcare data. Thank you.